Hi, folks. Um, sorry about the delay. Um, my name is Yev Meyer. I'm a senior data scientist at Guru. Um, and today I will be talking to you about empowering people on customer facing teams with a little bit of ML. So, first, uh, what is Guru? Um, at Guru, we believe that the knowledge you need to do your job should find you. Um, and that piece, find you, is really important. Right? It's really the opposite of how people typically look for information. And this is where the machine learning aspect um, comes in. Um, and the reality is that in today's world, knowledge workers spend a lot of their time moving between many different applications just to be able to find the information that they need to accomplish their task. Um, so if you think of you know, your average startup, not even a big company, um, you have information that might live in Dropbox, in Google Suite, and Google, uh, Google Suite, Google Docs, um, Google Spreadsheets. Um, there might be information in Salesforce, in Intercom, in Zendesk, um, um, in Slack. It's really spread all over the place. And when people think about knowledge management, they usually think of Confluence. They think of wiki sites. Um, and it becomes very hard to know where to look for that information. And even when you find it, you don't know if you can still trust it. Right? You look at that Confluence article. You see that it was written six months ago or a year ago. And you have no idea if it's still relevant, if you can trust that information. And so this is where Guru comes in. Um, and just to give you a little bit more perspective on this, uh, Microsoft recently did a study where they actually looked at how people work. Um, this is uh, three years old, right? So uh, things like Slack and Microsoft Teams, uh, in some sense, are exacerbating this as well. Uh, but what Microsoft found is that information workers, on average, switch windows 373 times a day, or around every 40 seconds, right? And you can imagine what kind of effects that has on um, them uh, multitasking, on them being able to complete tasks. Um, it's just, it, it is information overload. People are getting distracted. They're switching context all the time. Um, and so this actually causes a lot of frustration. Um, and so at Guru, uh, we believe that there is a different way to do this. Um, and again, the mission is that the knowledge you need to do your job should find you. Um, and we use ML to support that mission. And so what Guru does is Guru gathers your company's knowledge from all the different sources where that information might reside. So think experts, right? A lot of time, very important information is literally in the head of the people who are working at your company. And so experts can create pieces of knowledge. We also get that knowledge from documents that might be in Google Suite and Dropbox and other places. And also from a variety of applications. So if you're on the support team, and you're working in Intercom, if you have a ticketing solution, uh, we can get that information in as well. And so we get that information, we unify it into a single source of truth, and then using machine learning, Guru surfaces that knowledge to you in your favorite work application. And so we integrate with a number of applications, here are just a few of them, Slack, Intercom, Zendesk, Salesforce if you're on the sales team, Gmail, et cetera. Um, here are just a few of the machine learning features we have in production. Um, and the goal is to not only surface knowledge to folks in real time, but also take management out of knowledge management. Right? One of the reasons knowledge management historically has failed is because it is a real burden to maintain a knowledge base. Right? You do have to manage. Some companies have dedicated people to just that aspect of knowledge management. And so we have a variety of features in production. This is just a selection of them. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus on AI Suggest Voice. And the idea behind AI Suggest Voice is that we would like to suggest knowledge in real time in phone conversations and conference calls. Right? So a lot of modern day teams spend quite a bit of their time in meetings, in conference calls. How can we facilitate these meetings, facilitate these conversations? And just to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, here we have Megan listening to uh, being on a conversation on a call. And so what we'd like to do is we would like to listen to audio of that conversation. We would like to be able to transcribe speech to text to see what is happening in that conversation. And we would like to recommend relevant contextual knowledge to Megan so that she you know, can experience this aha moment. And when a customer asks a particularly 
tricky question. She knows how to navigate that conversation instead of saying, you know what, this is a really good question. Let me get back to you. And what happens a lot of the time, people forget to follow up, right? Or it just generally leads to bad customer experience. Um, so let's dive into AI Suggest Voice. Um, I'm gonna show a very brief demo, which is just a GIF. Um, but what I wanted to show is on the left, um, you see that the guru is listening to that conversation. In the top right corner, um, we have people on a conference call. They're talking to each other. Um, and we're listening to the conversation. We are um, transcribing the conversation in real time and we're surfacing relevant pieces of information. And so what you see there are titles of cards from the knowledge base that are relevant to that interaction. Um, and um, on the right-hand side, you will see when the person clicks in, they're able to see the content of the card, and you will also be able to see the transcription itself. And so here's the group system is listening. Somebody's asking, I'm trying to use analytics, but the group list isn't appearing, and so there is a card that is relevant and is explaining how to navigate that situation. And as the conversation progresses, you know, it goes into discussion of um, collections and how to properly set them up. We bring relevant cards so that the agent can talk to the customer and navigate their questions. And so um, I hope this gives you a more concrete sense of what we're trying to do. And um, it turns out this is a very hard problem to solve end to end. And there are several reasons for this. So um, what I showed on the previous slide, this is, um, in this instance, a desktop application. Um, uh, so this could be on your Mac machine, this could be on Windows. Um, and on the client side, uh, the problem is hard because you want to first be able to capture audio for both parties. And two parties is really the simplest case in all of this, right? There are a lot of meetings where you have quite a few participants. And so you want to faithfully capture that audio and you want to be able to stream it in real time. Um, you want to be able to support a variety of operating systems and hardware. And you also want to create a user experience that does not distract, right? The last thing we want to do is, be, is, is distract the person from the conversation they're having. Um, so we really want, in that sense, I suggest voice to be that little whisper in your ear. It's like, hey, there is something relevant here. And so the reason I bring this up is that it has really important implications for the data science side of it, right? What can we actually capture? What kind of information, what kind of interactions? What can we show to the user? Um, and so this becomes really important when we start thinking about building ML on top of this data. Now, that's just the client side. On the data science side, um, fundamentally, we want to, at a high level, transcribe speech and suggest knowledge. And we want to do both of these things in real time, right, as that conversation is progressing. So this is very difficult. We also want to be able to handle speech detection. We're not necessarily interested in everything that is happening, right? Uh, there, there could be a lot of silence. There could be clapping. Um, uh, we're really interested just in speech, in the information present in that meeting. Um, you have to be cognizant of multiple speakers being present in the room or on the call, right? So how do you handle speaker separation? And noise, right? Noise, um, there could be back music playing in the background. It could be raining outside. Um, if somebody could be having a conversation in the adjacent room. And so all of this makes it a challenging environment. And then you also want to take custom jargon into account, right? If we're talking about um, Shopify or Spotify, right? They use very different lingo to talk about their products, right? And that's not even part of the regular English language necessarily. How do we take that custom jargon into account to be able to transcribe things well and suggest knowledge? Um, on the infrastructure side, we want to have a scalable infrastructure for streaming, model training, and serving. And we really want to embrace customer diversity, right? So um, every customer is different. The nice thing about Guru is that it is a vertical agnostic solution, so it doesn't matter whether you're in the e-commerce space, um, if you are um, in the music space, if you're manufacturing cars, right? Everybody has a knowledge management problem and every team has a knowledge management problem. And so with that in mind, you want to embrace the diversity and you do want to serve multiple models supporting all of the above in production. Um, and um, when it comes to 
transcribing speech specifically, you want to make it cost effective, right? If we think about current providers out there, right, there are really only three companies who do that. There is Amazon, there is Microsoft, um, and there is Google. And the reason they're able to offer speech-to-text APIs is because they have invested, invested decades of labor and money to collect the data to be able to build models to transcribe speech-to-text. Of course, that comes at a price because they did invest a lot of time and effort into it. And so these services are prohibitively expensive. So if you're trying to do this at scale, if you're trying to support thousands of agents for a particular customer, right, this, is not, this is not a viable solution. So we're driven to this for financial reasons. We are a startup. <laughs> but the added benefit is that you can actually, instead of working with a general solution that um, a Google or uh, AWS uh, or Azure uh, API is, we can build a specialized model that is built for a very specific purpose and very specific use case. Um, and then the last, but probably most important, is the challenge I already alluded to is how do you get data for training the model to be able to transcribe speech to text? So here's a high level architecture uh, of AI Suggest Voice. We have a voice client um, that is streaming audio data to us to the data science side, so the uh, Guru Streaming Speech to Knowledge API. Um, when we started working on this, we were very lucky in that um, Amazon actually rolled out API get Gateway WebSocket, right? And so what that meant for us is that we didn't have to worry about scaling to thousands of persistent connections, right? This is something that could be essentially done for us, and we're using a streaming um, API, so there's very little overhead. We just send in the information that we need. Um, and um, because we wanted to keep things um, quite cost effective, we designed this whole architecture using a serverless, serverless framework. And so um, after the data arrives, the WebSocket API, we have an authentication service that is um, you know, powered by Lambda, um, and we also um, sending um, audio frames to our speech-to-knowledge service, right? And the job of the speech-to-knowledge service is to aggregate audio frames that are coming in through the WebSocket, right? And we then have to stitch all these audio frames to get actual audio segments. We would like to persist the session, uh, the voice session to S3, and then speech-to-knowledge service orchestrates the rest of the work that needs to be done. Um, and so it uses the Guru Inference API to call speech-to-text that we will dive into a little bit more. And the job of the speech-to-text service is to transcribe the audio being sent by the speech-to-knowledge service. Speech-to-text is built on top of ECS. It is using models that have been pre-trained, so we have models and features in S3. And um, once the speech-to-text service transcribes um, an utterance, right, we want to actually accumulate um, utterances in a conversation before suggesting knowledge. And so speech-to-knowledge service then makes requests to the text-to-knowledge service so that we can surface relevant information to the user in real time. And so again, all of this ha has to happen in cl as close to real time as possible. So let's dive in a little bit more into speech-to-text specifically. Um, and so nice thing about doing this um, in 2018 and 2019 is that you know, we're not starting from scratch. We're literally standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, what I'm showing here is a um, paper published by Baidu Research. And so literally giants, we're dealing with um, e-commerce giant and we're also dealing with a uh, giant of the data science community. Andrew Ong is one of the um, co-authors on this paper. And what is unique about this paper is not that it is using deep learning. Neural nets have actually been applied to speech recognition for over 20 years. Uh, what is unique about this paper is that prior to it, there was really no true end-to-end -end deep learning solution. So people would use um, neural nets in various parts of their speech recognition service, but they would still have to um, hand engineer a lot of the features. 
and uh, be, to be able to take care of things like noise and reverberation and aligning um, audio frames to the transcription. Um, people were using hidden um, Markov models. Um, so traditional systems employ very heavily engineered processing stages. And Baidu's was really one of the first demonstrations that you can apply deep learning end-to-end -end, and you can predict sequences of characters from input audio. Um, they followed up with another paper called Deep Speech 2 where they ex explored um, various architectures, so sort of a deeper analysis on what could be done end-to-end. -end. Um, and I really wanted to give credit to Baidu because uh, by publishing these results, which is also unique in the industry, right, when we look at what Google is doing or what Amazon is doing, it's actually really hard to find detailed descriptions of what is being done. Um, and so I really want to give them credit for publishing this because the publication of this led to democratizing speech research um, in the community. And so as an example, one of the companies that has been building on top of this is Mozilla. Um, they were inspired to further contribute to this research. And so we're um, standing on the shoulders of both of these giants and we're building on top of what has been done before us. And so here's the approach at a high level. Um, so given an utterance, x of t, so this is just a function in time, right? This could be an amplitude in time. We would like to generate a transcription sequence y hat of t, uh, y hat. And so every, um, um, every member of that sequence, y hat of tau, right, is a letter, let's say, in the English alphabet, a through z. And we also add a space here. And so tau here denotes the index within the sequence. Um, and just to make things a little bit more concrete, so on the bottom you see this function, x of t. Um, it's an amplitude waveform in time. The goal is for us to go from that representation to the text above. And here, what we're saying is the knowledge you need to do your job should find you. Um, and um, just to clarify, the notation i here is an utterance, right, n utterance. In our training data set, for example, we could have n utterances. <coughs> Um, and so the general approach that we take is that we train a neural network that would allow us to extract y hat from the final layer of that network. Um, and this becomes our acoustic model. And what we do is we use a recurrent neural net. And the reason we do that is because recurrent neural nets are really good sequence learners, right? So when you're trying to transcribe speech, you actually do want to see what happened before and potentially what happened after as well in that audio. And because they're such powerful sequence learners, we can effectively incorporate the state where, where the speaker e is in order to be able to predict what is being said. Um, as features, what we use for this RNN um, is a sequence of log spectrograms. So we take that initial audio input that is a function of time and we convert into the spectral domain Basically what we do is we take a fast Fourier transform every 20 milliseconds and we end up with a sequence of these log spectrograms. And then we have um, a few layers in the network. And so the first three layers are non-recurrent, they're fully connected. Um, and the idea is to take the neighboring context C into account. So when we look at that spectrogram, we look at a context not at any given point in time. We do want to see what is happening in the neighborhood of that a specific point in time. Um, and then the fourth layer is our recurrent layer. The difference between what Baidu did and what we're doing is that um, Baidu employed a bidirectional approach. We're using a unidirectional approach. And the reason we're doing this is because in a bidirectional approach, you wanna go forward and you wanna go back, which means that the output at any given time depends on future input, right? And that's a challenge for us because we're trying to transcribe in real time. So as we're transcribing in real time, we want to make sure that the output, the transcription, at this point in time depends only on things that we have seen in the past. And then the fifth layer is a standard softmax layer. You essentially have a bank of neurons that are representing characters in your alphabet, right? And we want to be able to read out the output of that bank to see what kind of character are we pre predicting. So this is just at a high level. Things get a whole lot trickier once you actually uh, start training this thing because um, it is a challenging problem to 
be able to match up the audio frames and the transcription, right? So in this example, what is, uh, what is being voiced is the word guru, but there are many different ways in which I can say guru, right? I could say guru, I could say guru, I could say guru, right? How do you, you, you basically end up with a variable length input, but a fixed length output, right? And it's a fundamental challenge in speech recognition. Um, and so the approach we employ is we use a connection, connectionist temporal classification. So this is a paper that was published back in 2006 by Graves et al. And the idea there is you actually want to enforce the length of the input and the length of the output being the same. Um, and the way you do that is that you say, you know, the, the fifth layer really encodes a probability of seeing a particular character given the input x. Um, and you do that over, sorry, uh, uh, encodes the probability of seeing a particular character sequence given the input x, uh, where the length of the character sequence is really the same as the length of the input. And one trick that you do here is you add a blank um, label, essentially, right? Because when you look at audio, you're not necessarily pronouncing things. And so in this, get, in this example, when we say guru, right, in the beginning there is nothing, right? So we say there is a blank. And then we start predicting what kind of character is present in that context, um, in that, in that um, window of context. And so you could see characters being repeated, right? That's why you see G, G, U, U. Um, and what you can do is you can define a many to one map B. And the reason it's a many to one map is because there are many different paths, many different ways to get to Guru. Um, so what I'm showing as a character sequence above could really be um, you know, one character G in the beginning and followed by two characters U. It all depends on how fast you say it. And even for the same audio sequence, you could potentially transcribe it differently depending on the speaker. And so what you end up is really with many paths to get to the same transcription. And so what you want to do is define a many to one map, taking these many different paths to um, the transcription text guru. And one way to think about this uh, map B is that it's essentially a squeeze operator that looks at these duplicate characters, gets rid of them, also gets rid of blanks. And what's really cool is that Graves et al. Show, showed that uh, there is a very efficient way using dynamic programming to compute this probability of seeing um, transcription Y given input X just by summing over all of these different paths. And furthermore, you can calculate the gradient of this, and which means you can use um, backpropagation to compute optimal parameters for this network. Um, so you can solve this maximum likelihood um, function and update the parameters theta. Now things are, so you could say, okay, we, we've trained, this is great, how do we actually do inference? The inference itself is actually tricky because in training we do have the labels, right? So we're able to calculate all these probabilities efficiently. At inference, um, it is very hard to be able to say uh, this is the most likely sequence. In fact, there is no tractable way of doing this, and you have to employ search to be able to find the best, um, uh, the, the, the most probable um, transcription. And so uh, there are several ways of going about this. You can simply use max decoding via the same operator B. You can also use prefix decoding that was proposed in that same paper by Graves et al. However, even with the best decoding, what ends up happening is that you see spelling and linguistic errors. An intuitive way to understand this is something that's called the Tchaikovsky problem in the literature. It's that if you haven't seen how to spell Tchaikovsky before, what the neural network is going to try to do, it's going to try to transcribe this to the best of its ability, right? So it might put a W instead of a V. Um, it might miss a C between the T and the H. Um, and so it really depends on what data you see what audio data you use to train this, what kind of labels you have available to you. And so we are quite limited when it comes to audio data, right? We have something much bigger at our disposal. And so typically what you want to try to do is actually introduce a language model into this. Um, and the idea behind the language model is that it actually captures uh, the probabilities inherent in the language, right? So when we think about an English language, if I say the word pause, right? 
you wouldn't necessarily know if that means a pause in a sentence or if it means an animal's pause, right? So we can use language model to effectively uh, take that context into account. What we use is an Ngram model uh, called CanLM um, that is available uh, that is trained on publicly available corpora. But this is essentially a plug and play situation because you could also be using other language models, right? So Bert, for example, is one of the things that um, is has been on the news uh, recently, um, and we can quickly look up words via Beam search. So one of the nice things about Ngram models is that you can actually very quickly look things up. But most importantly, you can quickly update these models. So you can update with new or newly important words for that particular context or that particular task. Um, and just to give you an example, this is from the original paper in Graves et al. Uh, what you see on the left is the RNN output without the language model, right? So it hasn't seen a lot of instances of Boston, and so it says, what is the weather like in Boston right now? Right, it doesn't know that it should be Boston spelled with the letter O. Um, because there were probably a few examples of that in the training set. Um, so this is, um, this is the, the main idea behind text-to-speech. And when it comes to the text-to-knowledge service, um, we're actually reusing, some, we're reusing a, a microservice already present at Guru. So this is a um, different uh, scenario where we are suggesting knowledge based on the text that people see, so this could be in a chat, this could be in a support ticket, this could be in email, uh, where we already have, think of it as transcribed speech to us, transcribed data, and so the idea here is to suggest the most relevant piece of knowledge or the most, the most relevant set of um, knowledge to, to the agent. And so at a high level, what we wanna do is offline, we would like to run an NLP pipeline to extract features from individual pieces of knowledge. In Guru, we call these cards. These are bite-sized pieces of information that a user can process very quickly. Um, and then we want to embed each card in a multidimensional space. Um, and then what we do is we use these features along with event data being generated by our users uh, to train a weekly supervised recommender system. And the reason it's weekly supervised is because not all interactions necessarily guarantee that that particular card or set of cards were used in a conversation, right? If somebody viewed a card, it may have been useful, maybe not. So in other words, the labels are noisy. But this is a good thing. There were several talks talking about the advantages of that because you can collect a whole lot more data, right? And you can, you can train effectively on this. And so this is the offline portion. And then online, what we want to do is we want to process newly observed text. So in AI Suggest Voice, this would be the freshly transcribed utterance and we want to use the same NLP pipeline and we want to suggest top K cards. And so just to quickly recap all of this, um, our mission is that the knowledge you need to do your job should find you. When it comes to AI suggest voice, what we mean is that we want to apply that mission to voice. And this is a really hard problem to solve end to end. However, it is doable given recent advances in end to end deep learning for speech recognition. Um, and if you use a recurrent neural net with connections, temporal classification, and a language model, this actually works quite well. Um, and then the speech-to-knowledge service for us is comprised essentially at a high level of two things, speech-to-text and text-to-knowledge service. And I wanted to dive into some of the lessons learned uh, because, again, this, this was and still is a hard problem. We're learning a lot and we're iterating on this. Uh, but among the lessons learned is that quality data is key. Um, the biggest challenge really uh, is on the transcription side. It's having access to audio data for training, right? Again, this is one of the reasons why only companies like uh, AWS and GCP and Azure are actually able to do this and offer this as a service, but they're surely charging a very nice premium for that. And uh, to put things in context, Baidu's network was trained on more than 10,000 hours of audio Right, so for any company, being able to generate 10,000 hours of audio is a daunting proposition. And Mozilla, again, was one of the companies that realized that access to such data will fundamentally allow for broad innovation in the space. And they actually started something called the Common Voice Initiative. And so you can go to uh, the Common Voice project online. Please do. The whole idea behind it is that you can contribute to this effort you can contribute 
not only your own voice, but you can also help transcribe speech, you can help transcribe utterances. Um, and what's really cool is that they're building this open source multi-language data set. And so when you look at it, there are actually, there's audio data available in a variety of languages, and this data set is growing in time. Um, that being said, even if you look at this, right, so at the moment, there are only 700 validated hours, right, so it's really um, at an early stage, it will definitely grow, and so you have to be clever and you have to use other sources, so you have to use other public data sets. Um, you can also synthesize data, right, so if you're looking to address issues with noise, for example, right, noise is something that you can synthesize to a certain extent, right, you can record um, that rain outside, right? You can record a conversation in the hall, in the coffee shop, right? And you can start superimposing different pieces of audio to generate noise. And when it comes to the language model, quality data matters as well, right? One of the things we mentioned the language model does is it incorporates probabilities inherently present in the language to be able to transcribe more effectively and correct for some of the deficiencies. The problem is that if you are trying to train this on publicly available data, right? What kind of publicly available data is available to us? There are a lot of um, audiobooks um, uh, or just plain books. Um, and um, when it comes to copyright, if you want to be able to use this, this effectively means older books, right? So this is older uh, English, not necessarily spoken English, not informal English or any other informal language. And so you have to be careful there as well. If you're trying to transcribe what is being said in an informal conversation, that becomes a real issue as well. Among other lessons learned, um, there are really a lot of, a lot of details that need to be figured out, um, even as, as simple as audio packets arriving out of order, right? Things happen, you need to make sure that things actually do arrive in order and you need to correct for that. Transcriptions could be generated out of order, right? It does take longer to transcribe a longer um, utterance, and so if you send off that longer utterance first followed by something shorter, transcription result for the shorter utterance might come back first. So you need to do a good job keeping track of all of this. When it comes to voice activity detection, to be able to detect when there is speech, uh, again, because we're trying to do this in a cost-effective fashion, um, doing serverless voice activity detection is actually a real challenge. Uh, state-of-the-art models usually have some sort of hidden state to them, right, and becomes a, a challenge uh, essentially sharing that state in a serverless environment. Um, Ngram language models are quite large, right, so again, if you're talking about having multiple language models in production, you need to think very carefully about how you're going to scale this. And there are just scalability lessons galore in all of this. And then probably the most important challenge is being greedy. Um, so. We are a small team, but we have grit, and no presentation is complete without a GIF. And since we are based in Philly, here is a GIF of Gritty, who is the mascot of the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, and the most important slide is everything discussed above is a fruit of many people's labor guru. A lot of smart people put quite a bit of effort into all of this. Some of us are present here in the audience today. This is the product data science team. Um, come say hi and stop by our booth. Uh, thank you, and I'll take questions. Have you experienced difficulties with uh, That's a great question. Yes, and that, that, that's one of the reasons why, again, companies like uh, Amazon and Google and Microsoft have invested so many years of effort into this. Amazon was actually really smart about, him, about putting Alexa into every single person's home. Right? What do they get with that? They get a variety of accents and ways to pronounce the exact same thing. Um, and so yes, you have to pay attention to that and you have to make sure that your data is, uh, is representative. And it's very much an iterative task and something you could be improving uh, for a long time.